We're very happy to welcome one of our most popular experts. His impressive resume includes heading up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to lecturing in psychiatry at Harvard for seven years before moving to Vancouver. Most recently, he's become one of the leaders in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy, which is the medical science of adjusting brain waves. In fact, a caller to his program last month referred to him as a miracle worker, and that was from a fellow doctor. We're very lucky to have him in Vancouver and answering your questions today. It's Dr. Paul Swingle, and this is It's All in Your Head. Last month, we spoke on the subject of uh, alcoholism. We've covered autism, Asperger's, depression, mood disorders. What area would you like to talk about today? Aging. Aging. And what kind of issues are related with the elderly and the aged? Well, we have all of the issues that everybody experiences, sleep problems, depression, and so forth. But the thing that really concerns the elderly are age-related declines in memory and cognitive functioning. And of course, the big A word, Alzheimer's, there's a lot that we can do about delaying the onset of Alzheimer's and certainly improving memory functions and age-related cognitive functions. Do you have a lot of clients right now that fall under that category that come visit you? Yes, we see a lot of elderly folks. One of the things that is really a pleasure to see is when an elderly person comes in and they're depressed and disillusioned. Somebody has told them that their memory is failing and they've gone to a physician or a psychologist and they told them that it may be the early stages of Alzheimer's and the person gets very frightened of course and concerned, can't sleep, becomes anxious and then they are often prescribed an anti-anxiety or a sleep medication and you know what the side effects of those are? Memory loss? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So we have what I call iatrogenic, that is uh, treatment caused Alzheimer's. I love to see this situation and the person comes in, we do a brain assessment, and usually I find that some areas of the brain are pretty sharp, and I uh, talk to them about that and get them off the medication, do what's called brain brightening, and today we'll go over exactly what that's all about. It's just like the person is reborn, the sparkle comes back in the eyes, they become interested in life and so forth. One of the jokes I have with these folks is, you have the brain of a rocket scientist, why don't you go back to school? A lot of the elderly folks come in and tell me that they decided they're not going to go back to school, but they still feel that rocket science is an option for them. (laughs) Is there an average age when you're talking about people that come and visit you with regards to age-related problems? That varies. Obviously, the folks that are not having a memory problem don't come to see me, so we're only sampling from the folks that have some sort of memory memory problem. The memory problem can be nutritional, it can be a sleep problem, it can be a drug-induced problem. There are a lot of things that will cause uh, memory loss or cognitive decline. So I can't really say there is an age where you're more likely to see it. I have a graph in front of me here. The nice thing about radio is that we can talk about it, but people can't see it. This gives you an idea of the declines, age-related declines in brain volume. We'll notice that men drop off much more precipitously than women do, but it's around the 65 age range is when you're going to start to get more noticeable age-related declines. It's interesting because my father's 70 and I notice it a little bit more now where he'll walk into a room and he'll stop and he'll sort of look befuddled and he'll say, why was I going in here? But I do that a lot too. And it's interesting that you said off air that memory loss is a behavioral thing. It's not necessarily a degenerative thing. Maybe you can explain that a little bit more. What we're concerned about is in your environment, how are you functioning? We have tests, of course. We can test your short-term memory, long-term memory, and so forth and so on. But in your environment, are you functioning adequately? What I mean by a behavioral measure is when a person comes to us and they are concerned about memory and cognitive decline and so forth, what we do is look at how the brain is functioning. And we can see if there are inefficiencies in the brain that would be related to cognitive decline, memory function, and so forth. We correct them, and then we ask the person, look, we're going to wait a couple of months come back and let us know how you're making out. So they are going to be mindful of their own cognitive functioning, memory functions. Come back and say yay or nay. Are they satisfied with where they are? Do they still have some areas of concern? One of the things we routinely find is that memory and cognitive functions are a function of poor sleep. A lot of the treatment that we do is focused specifically on improving sleep. And we have some brainwave things that we can do in terms of improving areas of the brain associated with sleep. There are also some products that people can use with or without neurotherapy. For example, there's a harmonic 
referred to as harmonic sleep that is available at Finlandia. It's one that we've produced. We use it with our own clients. There's also a supplement mix referred to as Silert, S-I-L-E-R-T, also available at Finlandia. And it's a mixture of things that you can blend it yourself. There's nothing specially unique about it. It has vitamin B6, valerian, and amino acid that people find very useful. So there are those things that you can do to improve your sleep. And if you improve your sleep, your cognitive function is going to improve anyway. I can tell you we get a lot of phone calls during this hour. We have in the past. So if you have any questions relating to Alzheimer's, dementia, age-related issues, or anything else for that matter, because Dr. Swingle is an expert on anything to do with what goes on inside your head. Dr. Swingle's number, by the way, is 604-608-0444. That's 608-0444. And in case you need to Google Dr. Swingle or visit his website, it's Dr. Swingle. Dot com and Swingle is spelt S-W-I-N-G-L-E. Before we get into more of the specifics about age and phone calls today, you've helped countless people resolve brain-related issues that are normally treated with medication. What is neurotherapy and biofeedback, and why don't more people know about it? Because you seem to have so much success. Neurotherapy is a procedure in which we modify brain activity. What we look at is the electrical activity coming from the brain, the electroencephalograph. Well, most folks know what an EEG is. If you've had a head injury, they'll take you to the hospital and do an EEG. We use the EEG diagnostically, and what we're looking for are areas of inefficiency in the way the brain is functioning. When we find areas of inefficiency associated with things like memory, for example, the way it's corrected is referred to as neurotherapy, and there are three general classes of treatment in neurotherapy. The first is neurofeedback, brainwave biofeedback. We set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do, You'll hear a tone or see something move on the screen. If you're a child, you play a video game with your brain. It's telling you about a brain activity you couldn't possibly feel. So you make use of that information to learn how to self-regulate. The second class of treatments are the brain drivers. There we measure a particular aspect of brain functioning. Based on that measurement, we stimulate with light, sound, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields, and so forth to nudge the brain into more normative functioning. By the way, my clinic is number one in North America in the development of brain driving technology, so we are able to treat severe autistic children that no other clinic will handle simply because we can do brain driving and serious Alzheimer's as well because of the brain driving technologies. The third class of treatments are things that you self-administer at home. For example, harmonic sounds, the one that I just mentioned, that influence the brain in a particular way. We know that because we pre-test it before we prescribe it. It's a CD you put into your stereo or into your Walkman or whatever it is you use, and it just uh, is a very quiet harmonic, and you play it at a quiet tone and helps you sleep, etc. We're going to talk more about neurotherapy, biofeedback, and age-related issues or anything you wish to ask Dr. Swingle. Talk to Jim in just a moment as we continue with Dr. Paul Swingle. Again, Swingle and Associates at 6.0. Four six zero eight zero four forty four. They're on Melville Street, drswingle.com. And we'll get to Jim in just a moment. This program is called It's All in Your Head, and we're happy to take your phone calls on any brain-related issue. Let's go to Jim. Jim, thanks for calling It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle. Hi. Um, I'm a psychologist, so I understand a lot of this stuff. But I have a 78-year-old friend who has polymyalgia, and his cognitive functioning seems to be deteriorating, and I'm concerned about him because he's been at a high level of functioning up until about two years ago. What do you mean by polymyalgia? Do you mean that you are having things similar to fibromyalgia? Yeah, I... I'm not sure of the total distinctions between fibromyalgia and polymyalgia. He has been diagnosed by regular medical doctors having polymyalgia, and he's on various drugs for that, obviously a very painful kind of condition. Okay. What that sounds like to me is that he has a number of those connective tissue issues that are keeping him from sleep, and it's very painful. The problem he's facing is they're putting him on pain medications that is having a serious effect on memory structures 
would be my guess from what you've described. The approach to this, which is probably what you're doing, is to deal with the pain and then try to titrate him off the pain medication because that's going to have a very serious effect on memory structures. Interesting. Now, you talked about fibromyalgia as an issue of the mm-hmm. aged, and one of the things that we talked about off-air and that you talk about each week is the danger of drugs and medication and that mm-hmm. we're very quick to prescribe. And I guess, you know, what you do at Swingle & Associates is the alternative to that, isn't it? Absolutely. What we do is correct the situation rather than try to mask it or put a Band-Aid over it with medication. Now, there are obviously times we want to medicate. For example, if a person is in severe pain, if they're ready to jump off the Barad Street Bridge, then we're going to prescribe any depressant medication. The problem we face in this culture is that if we are feeling unhappy, we want to medicate. If there's something we want a quick fix to it, take a pill. The problem is there are some very serious side effects associated with this. For example, we were discussing off air earlier on the mortality risk associated with antipsychotics used with the elderly. The risk of death associated with that is second only to cancer and heart failure. So it's not a benign issue. Certainly the antidepressants, sedatives and so forth have very serious problems associated with memory. When do antipsychotics usually get uh, prescribed to an elderly patient, Dr. Mingle? Anytime an individual is not responding to typical antidepressants, for example, often antipsychotics are recommended. If the person is having psychotic episodes, certain forms of depression, they tend to prescribe that. Unfortunately, they're starting to do off-label prescribing. We have a lot of children on Remron, which is an antipsychotic. I'm really very concerned about the way we're medicating normal children's behavior, for example, with these very powerful and dangerous medications. Does it make your job more difficult when you're talking about neurotherapy and biofeedback when a patient has been on medication for a long time? Like, would it be easier for you to treat people if they hadn't have been on the medication in the first place? Our major problem is people who come in who are heavily medicated. You're fighting the medication, of course. If you're trying to work with depression, for example, you want the person to feel and process and deal with the depressed mood states. If they're very heavily medicated, then you're fighting that in a sense. And we have very serious problems of individuals who come in who are very heavily medicated and very frightened. They're not doing well, otherwise they wouldn't be sitting in front of me. You find they're at max levels of antidepressants, sleep medication like trazodone and so forth, and yet they're doing very poorly, but they're afraid to come off the medication. They can't go any higher on the medication, so we have an extremely serious problem on our hands. One of the major issues is how do you bring a person off the medication? You simply can't just stop. One of the problems we have is that very often... The person running the meds will tell the person, well, you're taking three tablets, take two. That's a very severe blow to the central nervous system. You have to come off in what we call statistical units. You're taking 100 milligrams, we'll take 90 and stay there for a while. While we do some neurotherapy to try to normalize brain activity, and then you come down a little more. Hmm. So with the end, this is a rather long-winded answer to your question, but yes, heavily medicated people are a very serious problem. Another serious problem is misdiagnosis. We're going to talk about that in just a second. You're listening to Experts on Call, and it's all in your head with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates. The number is 6080444, and the website is drswingle.com. That's S-W-I-N-G-L-E.com. And we're happy to take your calls on any brain-related issue you have, but today we are specifically talking about the aged and the elderly. And I know one of the things that happens to you, maybe you have a specific example, is that somebody comes in, um, you know, 70 years plus misdiagnosed as having Alzheimer's. Have you had an example of that before? Oh, a lot. We referred to that earlier. The woman who comes in, somebody has told them they're becoming forgetful. They go to a physician and the physician says, well, it may be early Alzheimer's. They get upset. They're given any depressant medication or a sedative or something to help them sleep or any anxiety medication. The side effect of that is memory loss. It seems to me that sleep is a huge common denominator in a lot of the patients that you treat. Is that one of the main things that brings people into the clinic? 
Yes, it is. And very often a person who comes in when they're telling us what the problems are will indicate that sleep is also a serious issue. We pay a lot of attention to that, get sleep regularized, and a lot of things will correct themselves if you do that. We're going to go through the uh, process from start to finish of what happens when you go to Swingle and Associates and the type of things that you go through. We're going to go through that uh, step by step because it is rather a simple and painless process. Hello, Barb. Thanks for calling here on with Dr. Paul Swingle. Hi, I just have a quick question here, and it's about, I guess, I don't know, it saddens me to hear so much about the prescription aspect of all in your head. I'm just wondering if the doctor has anything to comment on the spiritual nature. Yes, absolutely. Whatever the person's spiritual metaphor happens to be, we support. Our practice is really quite an energy-oriented or spiritual practice, if you want to think of it in those terms. We do a cranial cycle therapy. We do energy techniques. The technicians we have are all quite spiritual and energy-oriented folks. We don't advertise that, but the spiritual aspect is critical in my judgment. Actually, when we're talking about things that you can do for yourself in the why not department, things like your spiritual orientation, the worst that can happen if you're spiritually oriented is nothing. It's not like the use of a medication in which you medicate and the side effects can be very serious. Similarly, when you're drinking water, for example, there's a lot of information coming out on the messages in water. There's a physician whose last name is Emoto, I think, E-M-O-T-O, who's done a lot of work on the energy in water, sort of uh, similar to uh, homeopathy. And when you take a glass of water, if you just think to yourself, goodness and mercy, there's some reason to believe that it actually changes the physical structure of the water. And that's what I consider the why not department. The worst that can happen is nothing. And then you also have the same theory with pets and plants too, for especially for elderly patients. Yes. If you can have a pet, great. If you can't, you can certainly have a plant. And there's carloads of evidence to indicate having plants or pets or hobbies generally has a very beneficial effect. The bottom line with regard to Alzheimer's, which is one of the topics we want to cover today, is basically use it or lose it. And I'm talking about memory function here. And that's really the major contribution of neurotherapy in which we brain brighten and the person is able to make use of their cognitive function, become more cognitively or intellectually active. And there's compelling research to indicate that you can really delay the onset of Alzheimer's with brain brightening procedures. We'll talk more about the procedure itself in just a moment and get to your calls. We have a couple of callers waiting. Dr. Paul Swingle and Associates, the telephone number at the clinic is 604-608-0444, 608-0444. And the website address, if you want more information, Dr. Swingle. Com. More coming up on Experts on Call. This program is called It's All in Your Head, and we're going to take a call from mm-hmm. Candy. Candy, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. Thank you, Dr. Swingle. I applaud you. Um, I, I really honor what you do. It's just fantastic. I'm so thankful you're here. Thank you. I have referred customers to you, and I see delighted parents come back and miracle worker yes I agree with that my question has to do with my mom my mother it's my mother's birthday today she's 94 God bless her wow wonderful she runs circles around me (laughs) (laughs) I I train police dogs and she runs circles around me Um, her tenacity just blows my mind she comes from another era but she certainly comes from a time when they didn't have all the chemicals and whatnot in their food she was from a self-sufficient organic soybean farm Mm -hmm. I basically want to ask why? I mean, with diet and supplements, I watch the control of this. Mm-hmm. The doctors are baffled, the doctors back east, because she has had Alzheimer's for 18 years. Yes. I would like to know what your opinion is on, is this reversible? Because I see it in front of my eyes. And unless she is misdiagnosed over and over again, her condition is absolutely reversible, controllable. Well, you know, the conventional wisdom is that it's an irreversible disorder. I share your belief. There are a lot of things that we thought were irreversible, that we see plain evidence of things correcting themselves. There's a lot of good data coming out now on Alzheimer's. The number one issue with Alzheimer's is use it or lose it. There was a study done with the religious orders of nuns, priests, brothers, and so forth, in which they had a controlled environment, and they could look at the longitudinally how people made out who were more cognitively active versus less cognitively active. The top 10% in terms of being mentally active were 47% less likely to develop Alzheimer's. 
a twin study done in Switzerland, for example, identical twins, so you have identical genetic uh, makeup, the more intellectually involved twin had a much level of development of Alzheimer's. Now, having said that, individuals who are more intellectually active, when they do get Alzheimer's, it tends to be more rapid. So there's a question of do you have more brain matter so that you have more reserves? Are you recruiting other areas if you're more intellectually active or are you actually doing something to the brain matter that is affected by the Alzheimer's? So it's hard to know exactly what's going on there. Now, nutritionally, I share this caller's belief that if we pay a lot of attention to the food that we take, that it'll make a tremendous difference. I assume, Candy, that your mother's soybean was not genetically altered soybeans. <laughs> soybeans. My understanding is it's hard to get a soybean that hasn't been genetically altered, and we don't have a clue what that's doing to the brain. Bottom line is when in doubt, pure. When in doubt, pure and then when in doubt, pure. Mm -hmm. The reversibility of Alzheimer's, if we get people early in the process, neurotherapy has a good track record for delaying the onset. When we have these very severe cases of Alzheimer's, the caregivers always report that the patient benefits in terms of being more aware and so forth. Let me give you an example. A recent client, the caregiver, said that the difference after neurotherapy, if they were walking with the Alzheimer's patient, they would have to be very careful when they came to a cross street because the patient would just walk out into traffic. After we did neurotherapy, they would stop and they were aware of the cars and the danger. To my judgment, that's not huge. I was expecting the person to jump up and recite Shakespeare. <laughs> But from the caregiver's perspective, it was a huge change. You're listening to Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle & Associates, 604-608-0444, 608 com, the website address as we go to Lenore. Lenore, thanks so much for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head. Yeah, hello. I'm diagnosed bipolar, but what's sort of scaring me is that I've heard that bipolar people are more likely to develop Alzheimer's, and I was curious as to your thoughts on that. Yes, I've heard of the same data indicating that. The real question here is that if you are bipolar and you're medically maintained, then we have the whole issue of the side effects of the medication. So we really don't know whether it's the medication that's associated with the declines in memory and cognitive functioning or whether it is actually the disorder. Having said that, we usually find comorbidities, as they're called. That is, if a person has one kind of neurological issue, there tends to be other kinds of things associated with it. That's a long-winded answer to say, I don't know. But if you look at the data, they are related. If you hadn't come on this program, I would have never known what clinical psychoneurophysiology uh, was. And, you know, I'd probably still be sleeping three some odd hours a night and tossing and turning. Uh, in fact, my girlfriend's a little annoyed because I, I snore now a lot. <laughs> but I do want to go through the process. You can't of, snore if you don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> true enough. Um, I want to go through the process for those who are, you know, it, it's a big sounding therapy, <laughs> neurotherapy, biofeedback, brain waves. It sounds a little intimidating. I can tell you that it's completely painless, quite relaxing. Let's go through the process. Somebody shows up at the clinic with, usually with an issue, but you don't even need to know what that issue is when they come visit you, do you? No, we don't ask people why they've come. What we do is the person comes in and we do a brain assessment. If it's not a stroke or head injury where we do a full brain assessment, if it's not one of those issues, then we do a simple analysis of six places in the brain. And that takes about 10 or 12 minutes or so. And then I do some calculations and I tell the person why they've come to see me. The brain tells us absolutely everything in terms of what the person's symptoms are. After we do that, then the person, assuming that the person agrees with what I told them, and generally they do, the way it's corrected is we simply normalize brain activity. For example, some problems in age-related declines in memory have to do with the slowing of a particular waveform, alpha as it's called. Alpha brainwaves run from 8 to 12 cycles a second. And what we're concerned of there is how fast is the alpha. That is, if you look at the 8 to 12 spectrum, where's the peak? And you want the peak to be in the high alpha, 11 to 12 cycles a second. As it slows down, that's related to age-related declines in memory, age-related cognitive declines, poor immune functioning, 
poor sleep, it's extremely important to keep the alpha fast. The good news with neurotherapy, we can keep it fast. That's a process referred to as brain brightening. Incidentally, it's exactly the same as what we do for athletes. When they, we're doing peak or optimal performance training for athletes, virtually all professional athletes do neurotherapy, by the way. It markedly improves their game. One of the harmonics that I've developed, the alert harmonic, I don't know if you've experienced that or not, then when some of the things that we gave you to play with, that alert harmonic will increase the speed of the alpha. So in addition to neurotherapy, there's a home treatment that you can do to keep the alpha fast and that improves memory and cognitive functioning. And generally speaking, that's a, a CD you pop in, you play it at a low volume. And that's right. What I recall from the one that I use, it sounds a little bit like the ocean or a little like white noise, like a that's right. Like yeah, that. Exactly. And you just put it on quietly. And, and another one is that I remember you using was the one that panned from one side of the brain to the other. And that was, I found that very effective. And then there's also light therapy too, which if I can just describe it to the listeners. It's like you put on a pair of sunglasses and inside there's tiny little strobe lights. And the effect that you get is if you close your eyes, it's like looking through the branches of a moving tree through the sunlight. Mm -hmm. It's very relaxing. I can tell you it's a very relax. The hardest part is staying awake, I found. <laughs> and because it is so relaxing and everybody really knows what they're doing at your clinic. So if you think that you might be aided by neurotherapy or biofeedback, let me give you the phone number. It's 608-0444, and that's such a wide range of issues. And we've talked about mood disorders, sleep disorders, issues relating to the aged. 604-608-0444. The website address, if you want more information, is drswingle.com, and swingle is S-W-I, like swing, L-E. We're going to get to Ralph in just a moment. He's got a question about strokes. We have Anna waiting patiently as well. We'll continue with more of your calls as we continue with Dr. Paul's swingle. It's all in your head. If you are interested in neurotherapy biofeedback, make sure you visit somebody who is a registered and certified neuropractitioner, which Dr. Swingle is. That's one thing we talk about every single week. We're talking about age-related issues today, but uh, we certainly welcome your call on any subject relating to brain or brain activity as we check in with Ralph. Ralph, thanks for waiting. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head. Could you tell us a bit about how neurotherapy might help someone who has brain damage due to stroke? Sure. Actually, this is the topic for next month, stroke and traumatic brain injury. February 12th. Right. What we do with stroke is a, what's called a full brain map, and that is we look at all 19 sites in the brain, and we're looking not only for areas of obvious inefficiency, but we're looking for inefficiencies in the way the brain is talking to itself, site-to-site -site communication. The treatment of stroke is like the treatment of any other condition. What we do is correct the anomalies that we find in the brain. Now, the level of technology that we use for stroke and traumatic brain injury is somewhat more detailed than what we do for simple problems like depression, sleep, anxiety, ADD, the simple problems. The more serious ones, traumatic brain injury. What we do is we take the brain data that we have and we compare it with a database now, the database is several thousand records of normal functioning brains, and we get a statistical statement between how the brain that we're measuring is differing from normative functioning statistically so that we can go and correct that and know precisely how that brain is changing towards more normative functioning. We see a lot of folks with stroke and closed head injury. And a lot of success, I'm assuming. What are some of the yes. things that you mm -hmm. could not do without neurotherapy? Do you know what I mean? Like you had a stroke, what, what are some things that will effectively change? Well, you have memory, you have sleep, and you have motor changes so that an individual who has a partial paralysis or neuropathy, they will regain function in some of those areas. Speech is a big one. As a matter of fact, that's what I should do next time. I have a tape of a woman who left messages on my answering machine before and after treatment and wow. when you can hear real difference in quality in her voice. Remind me to do that for the next session. That's an excellent idea. Thanks for your call, Ralph. As we continue with your phone calls here to Dr. Paul Swingle, it's all in your head. Let's check in with Anna. Anna, thanks for calling. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. Good day, gentlemen. The reason I'm calling, I've been having for about now, it's been almost six months. Uh, I've had such a horrible anxieties and my body's just going through the bad convulsions of, you know, uh, shakiness and nervousness and everything. My brain feels so tight and, and I don't know, I'm just 
and I don't know what to do. I have been uh, seen by the homopathic doctor, and now I'm going to the natural path doctor to cleanse my body and stuff, and I was wondering how this system can help me. We see a lot of folks with anxiety. The question is, where in the brain do we find the inefficiency? There are many, many different conditions that can give rise to the anxiety problem. For example, do you find when you become anxious that you have a sickish feeling high up in your chest? Anna, are you still there? No, she's not. Oh, okay. If that's the case, for example, that's a condition referred to as premature ventricular contraction in the heart, where there's a sickish kind of buzzing feeling up in your upper part of the chest, and it feels like you're coming apart at the seams. A lot of people who develop panic disorder have that kind of condition. In addition to correcting some of the brain activity, we would regularize the heart functioning to reduce those subjective feelings of anxiety. Is that uh, when you actually add the uh, the pulse on the on the wrist? Is that part of uh, yes? Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's one of the things that uh, they do at the clinic. And I suggest you uh, give Doctor Swingle a call at six zero four six zero eight zero four forty four. Especially when you refer to anxiety as one of the simple issues that you treat, I think that's very encouraging for a lot of people that to hear that that is a simple issue that you can treat with neurotherapy. As long as the person doesn't come in as a poster child for the drug companies in terms of being super medicated, that really complicates things. But if a person goes through an episode of anxiety, then there may be some environmental things that are giving rise to it. There are a lot of things that we check out, but the first thing we do is have a look at the brain to see if there are any enabling conditions. One common one is a deficiency of slow frequency in the back of the brain, so that the brain lacks the capability of rapid self-calming. And we correct that, and usually that takes care of the problem. You know, it's interesting, you know, with sleep issues, which was a a huge issue with me just because of my wild hours and whatnot, just knowing that you could identify it before I even told you about it and knowing that there's a treatment for it almost psychologically can help you too, can it? Just knowing that there's something other than medication that can help you deal with your issue is always like is the light at the end of the tunnel syndrome, isn't it? I have some really wonderful stories about that. There was a little girl who came in and she was so depressed and disheartened. She had been diagnosed as some silly thing, ADD or whatever. She came in, I did a brain assessment, and she happened to have really sharp frontal lobes. And I said to her, you have the frontal lobes of a rocket scientist. The mother (laughs) called me about three days later and she said, the little girl came home, told everybody, Dr. Swingle said, I have the brain of a rocket scientist. (laughs) Problem over. She did very well in school. We did a few sessions with her to correct a couple of things, but that was really funny. We're going to get to Helen and Al in just a moment. Just going to pause for a quick break here again. The number for the clinic, Dr. Swingle and Associates, is 604-608-0444. That's 608-0444. And the uh, website address is drswingle.com. And so if you have any questions, you can ask the clinic or certainly uh, make an appointment and uh, start living your life again, really, in many cases. We'll have more of your calls. We'll get to Helen and Al in just a moment as we continue. Today, we've been talking specifically about age-related issues, and we have Helen on the line. Let's go to Helen. Helen, you're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head. Uh, Hi. I was just uh, wondering about the word dementia. I haven't heard that used for many years. Is that the same as Alzheimer's? No, it's not. Dementia refers to cognitive declines, inefficiencies in intellectual functioning. There is dementia associated with Alzheimer's too, of course, but they are independent conditions. And you treat both, of course, at the clinic? Yes, we do. The number again at the clinic is 604-608-0444, 608-0444. A little earlier on in the show, you were talking about a couple of products. The Number one, the harmonic CD that you developed, but also a supplement that people can help because of uh, the, you know, the importance of sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about those? My clinic has developed a wide range of harmonics that we use for everything from alcoholism to sleep problems to ADD. A lot of those were developed when I was at Harvard Medical School at McLean Hospital. The nice thing about them is there are no side effects. The worst that can happen is nothing, which is what I like with any treatment. What they do is they modify brain wave activity. So for the ADD child, for example, it decreases excess of slow frequency activity. For the sleep problem, it increases a waveform in the back of the brain and so forth. The supplement that is used for sleep is referred to as Silert, S-I-L-E-R-T, available at Finlandia. 
And that's basically a blend of some things that we know help with sleep onset and sleep quality. It includes things like vitamin B6, valerian, St. John's wort, an amino acid. Again, the worst that can happen is nothing. They're all antioxidants, so if it doesn't help you sleep, it'll help with the antioxidant issue. What brings most people to your clinic, Dr. Swingle? Well, with kids, it's problems in school, ADD, learning disorders, sleep and depression and anxiety are big ones. And of course, aging and uh, a fair number of head injury and stroke. And when people find out that there can be a treatment, and obviously after a few sessions, I'm sure that they already start noticing some kind of difference. Obviously, you must see a huge change in mood and behavior and, and just their overall demeanor. Yes, usually when we're treating something like uh, head injury, for example, the first thing that approves is mood. And the reason for that is after a few treatments, the person notices some changes and it's not over then, but they know they're on the right track. And that has a huge effect on their mood. So the first thing we see is major mood changes. The second thing that usually changes is voice in areas like stroke, for example, and then motor. Right. How do you know how many sessions it's going to take when you deal with a patient? Is it completely individual? Does it depend on whether they've been taking medication or not? How do you know? Yes. The brain assessment will give us some idea. For example, if it's a child with, there are many forms of ADD, for example, if they have the simplest form of ADD, common ADD, I know that 15 to 18 sessions are going to be out of there. If a person comes in with a severe sleep disturbance and they're not medicated, the area in the brain that I think is going to be problematic turns out to be problematic. I can predict that, again, 20 sessions or so, the problem will be corrected. If they're medicated, all bets are off mm -hmm. because we really have to get them off the medication before we can correct the brain activity. And that's a function of how long they've been on the medication, which ones and so forth, and how they're reacting to it. You know, some people have severe withdrawal effects from things like benzodiazepines, which the drug companies maintained had no withdrawal until oh, about five or six years ago, I suppose. And I guess one of the most important things that we should mention just before we wrap things up here is that these changes are permanent. I mean, once you fix something in the brain, it's fixed, isn't it? That's correct. So I guess for the time that you spend in therapy, the cost of the therapy, it's probably one of the best bargains going. Best deal on the planet. Are you allowed to tell us how much it is? Sure. The intake assessment is $180 and then each treatment averages about $100. By the way, I'm a registered psychologist, so uh, this treatment is covered under extended medical, and whatever is not covered under extended medical is a tax-deductible medical expense. Can't thank you enough for all your insight, information, and for doing what you do. I know you have a lot of very satisfied patients that have come through the doors, and if you want to see Dr. Swingle yourself, make an appointment, 604-608-0444. That's 608-0444. See you in a month, Dr. Swingle. Okay. And this is It's All in Your Head.